ought to be trying to reproduce, but it, it, it's not. So uh, this, this could be called reproductive senescence. Maybe it's something like that's going on. It's something that probably needs to be studied to be understood better. Okay, we're about to switch rocks here. So if you look at this rock, this gray rock and the way it's sculpted, this is limestone. Uh, and it will produce those basic soils with different kinds of soils that uh, different kinds of plants like. So we're heading off to Hinch Mountain now. And this is a place that goes up to 3,000 feet. It's a little different than the gorge we've been looking at. It's up higher. And next to it is Dorton Knob, and it's also limestone. So here's a picture from Inch Mountain, looking back across the Dorton Knob. And you see this gray area up and through here. That's all limestone. I'll show you what that looks like close up here in a second. There it is. That's what you're looking at. Very interesting plant habitat. It'd be really good to explore this and, and, and figure out what all might be living in it. Up on a mountain uh, on that kind of habitat. Very interesting habitat. Here's uh, actually a piece of the Cumberland Trail. It's not been officially opened, but it's well, well made at this point, running along the base of a limestone uh, cliff. And over here on this side is the Sequatchie Valley. We'll, we'll see a little view of the Sequatchie Valley in a second. Okay, here's a view down into Sequatchie Valley from up on Hinch Mountain. This is about halfway up Hinch Mountain, looking back down into the Sequatchie Valley. The headquarters for the Cumberland Trail State Park is down in this area down here. It is now open on the weekends. You might want to go visit there. Interesting areas, uh, and the trails up up from there to the the Cumberland, uh, the Cumberland Trail are not really fully built yet, but they're they're working on it. Okay, this was my first Cumberland Trail spring wildflower. I saw this on uh, February the tenth. That was my first. So it's always interesting to think about when do you see your first wildflower. Actually, I'd seen another wildflower before this. Uh, I'd seen a, a, a paddock in, in bloom a couple of days before this in the Oak Ridge area. Uh, this, is, this is an abnormal plant. This is, is not really well developed. It's, yeah. um, it's kind of low. We'll, I'll show you a well developed plant in a second. This was the only one like this, of this plant that I saw in bloom in the whole area. There are hundreds of plants, none of them were in bloom. This was the only one at that, on that February day. So this is round leaf ragwort. And one thing I didn't point out here. You see these, these structures here. Those are ray flowers, but they're not fully developed. This is a composite. That's what they'll turn into when they're fully developed. Up here. In the center, you'll have the disc flowers. So this is a composite or a sunflower family member. This is round leaf ragwort. The way to know which ragwort it is is to look at the shape of the leaf. This is kind of roundish. They do vary quite a bit. And it, it, can, it can be, there's another golden ragwort, which can be a little bit similar. Right? It has more of a Cordate base, more of a heart shape base to the leaf. But this is the one that you're going to see a lot of uh, away from uh, moist bottoms. The, the golden one is more in the moist bottoms. So here's what it'll look like when it's fully developed. Here you can see the, the uh, stem leaves, and there's those round leaves to make it the round leaf one down at the bottom. Here they are nice, nicely fully developed. In this picture here. Okay, there's our symbol for the NPS, huh? Tennessee Native Plant Society symbol. You know what this is, right? Southern red trillium. Uh, we can argue sometimes about whether it's northern red trillium. That's the trillium erectum. I think this one probably pretty clearly is sulcatum because it does. It has these rather abrupt endings to the, the uh, petals. So what do we know about trilliums? They have three petals, three leaves, or sometimes they call these bracts. Some people make technicalities. These are the three. Uh, sepals here, and then the sexual parts are in here. We're going to look at some more of these for a second. So this is up, what we're still up on Hinch Mountain. And look at this. Here's a yellow <laughs> version of the same thing. So this is the yellow form of the southern red. And on Hinch Mountain, it takes every form. So we can, this was a good one to look at some of the structures here. These are the anthers, and the stigmas. So the anther, uh, that's what gives the pollen. The stigma is what receives the pollen, hopefully not from the same plant. You, you want to outcross your plants for better reproduction. You're seeing another species of trillium here in the background. We'll, we'll talk about that later. In fact, not much later, right here. So here are two white trilliums. Uh, and they are two different species. And you start to notice the differences here. Notice that all the sexual parts, the males and female parts in here, are all white. And over here, they're yellow. 
And particularly useful to note is the wavy edge to these petals here. This is undulate, they go up and down in the, in three, in the three dimensions, not in the plane of, of the petal itself. So this one over here, this is bent trillium, trillium flexipes. And this one over here, large fire trillium, trillium grandiflorum, which maybe a lot of you are familiar with. And these are in the group of trilliums we call wake robins. So I'm gonna, just for contrast here, we'll, we'll look here at a toad shape. And you see the difference here, the, the flowers are uh, right on top of, of the leaves, they're sessile, they're, they're stemless. And another thing about th these is that the, uh, the, the petals stick up sort of protecting the uh, sexual parts inside. They're kind of hidden, which is different from the wake robin. So this is, this is a, what, the one of the most common toad shades upon uh, Inch Mountain. There's another one. And this one you may be more familiar with and the people who live in central Tennessee probably have seen some of this. So this is a, once again, a toad shade. It's got the petals sticking up, sort of protecting things in the center there, making the pollinators kind of get in, get in between there. Notice the sepal it is highly reflexed, highly pushed back. So that's where the name of it comes from. This is recurved trillium, trillium recurvatum of a curvatum. It's based upon this being bent back. And this is also a common toad shade up on Hinch Mountain. And here we go again, sulcatum, red, white, red and white. Notice that the dark centers, this is, this, we're not looking at uh, grandiflorum here. Uh, in the background, you see a lot of the Larkspur delphinium, which is very common up on Hinch Mountain. So in a lot of ways, Hinch Mountain looks like Taylor Hollow because of the limestone connection. But it's way far east in Tennessee and it's surprising that it has some of the plants at the time. This is what much of the hillsides look like. They're absolutely gorgeous. And here's a list of some of the species, the Trillium flexipes, Trillium grandiflorum, Trillium sulcatum, with the uh, Delphinium tricorn, the, the dwarf larkspur. And there are just acres of this stuff. It's just incredible. Just the most beautiful thing you could ever see. And here's the rare Trillium from Hinch Mountain. So look at this. This is only about an inch long here. Look at the long, narrow leaves, very different from the other trilliums, but look at the undulate edge. So you know that this one is related to the grandiflorum. So they sometimes talk about the undulate, undulate, uh, undulatum group of the uh, trillium. Here's the sepals, they're rather different too. They kind of turn the other way from uh, some of the sepals we've been seeing. And so we have the species of dwarf trillium, trillium pusillum. And one of the things about the dwarf trilliums they have a highly disjunct distribution. There's, they have small populations scattered all over the place, highly separated from them by, in many cases, hundreds of miles. So how do you explain a, a distribution like that? Well, usually we say it's either relictual or long dispersal. Relictual means it used to be a much bigger distribution and somehow it died back to just a few places. But, uh, sometimes by the changes in climate, other things cause that to happen. I don't know what would have caused the dwarf trilliums to become relictual. The other possibility is that their seeds are being carried long distances and finding good habitat a long ways from other populations. That's a problem for trilliums because trilliums in general are dispersed by ants and they don't go very far. So very unlikely that long range dispersal is the answer. It's probably some kind of a reptile uh, distribution, which I really don't understand how that is, would be, but somebody may figure that out someday. Here's the same thing. Here's the dwarf trillium again. And notice it's turned pink. That's just like the grandiflorum turns pink. They're in the same group together with that undulating margin. And there's some baneberry for you. Doll's eyes, Actia alba. This is a nice picture, stick it in. Here's another one. This is one that you, you probably see a lot in, in, in central Tennessee, not very common in East Tennessee. And here it is up on Hinch Mountain. Where we see so many of these things. That, you would think of more on the limestone in central Tennessee, not so common. So wild hyacinth, commissius as glues. Now, this is the form that this plant takes most of the time. It's often vegetated without flowers. It has this big basal rosette. Some of you may recognize this. I'll show it to you now with the flowers. Here it is. It is a very tall plant. This is 
my friend uh, David Nestor, I work a lot with at TVA. Here's the top of the plant. And I got another picture here that really shows those flowers well. So what is it? Monument plant, American Colombo, Fraser of Carolinaensis. Is it monocarpic? Monocarpic means it only reproduces one time and then dies. And uh, if, you, if you read the uh, Tennessee Native Plant Society book, it says this plant is monocarpic. I've heard that in other places. On the other hand, our hero, Dennis Horn, has grown this plant in his yard, and he says it flowered and then didn't die. So who knows? Is it really monocarpic? It's an interesting concept. So is this our, our tallest herbaceous spring wildflower? I think it is. I can't think of any other one. They said to go to 10 feet. This one, maybe not quite 10 feet, but it's, it's getting up there. So our tallest spring wildflower, I would think so. And here's that lovely picture from Susie Askew uh, showing the flowers. They are kind of pretty. They can be sort of greenish or whitish. Really beautiful. And here's a close up of, of one flower. And I have no idea what these bumps are about on here, what, they, what, their, what their, their function is for the plant. Uh, somebody may know. Okay, so in this picture, you see two very similar leaves. Both have the red base, basically fairly sim similar in their, their uh, mid veins. Uh, this one over here, this is the American Colombo or monument plant. Uh, this is a shooting star. Now, two plants in living together, and these two live together, they're, they're both on limestone rocky areas, and they have very similar leaves, but they're not closely related. You might wonder what's going on. Perhaps there's leaf mimicry going on. Uh, why, would you, why would they want to mimic each other? Well, if one of them is bad tasting to the deer, and the deer can't tell the difference between the leaves, it might... might uh, protect the other one. Or they might be helping to, to teach the deer that both of them are bad tasting. So there's one-sided mimicry, where one is trying to look like the other to get an advantage. Or they may be both trying to look like each other to, to, uh, to train the, the deer better as to which things are bad tasting. And famously, the, the viceroys and the monarchs, we, people studied that. And now they're saying, instead of it being one-sided, which they used to say, they're saying it's actually mutualistic, that both are bad tasting. I have another example down here. I just throw this in where there is extreme uh, appearance of stream mimicry uh, going on between these two species. Okay, here's another one we would expect to see more in central Tennessee. And here it is up on Hinch Mountain. Sanandra, huh? sometimes called Dian Dot Beauty. Sometimes we just go by Sanandra. It's the only thing in the genus so that there's no confusion. And when there's only one plant in the genus, it's called monotypic. It's a monotypic genus. You can see the, the uh, cream color with the nice stripes on it. Lovely little plant. Okay, what is this one? Here's, here's one that's not so conspicuous. And you're looking down there and you're saying, oh, interesting, it's got these, these petals here. Well, it's not really what they are. So this is Cumberland Spurge, Euphorbia mercuriana, Lina. And I'm gonna show you close up here a little bit. Look at this thing, there's some fruit sticking out here. This is from one of the little flowers. There's a whole bunch of little flowers in here. And one of them is actually in fruit, those little flowers in here. And these things around the edges are just part of the invocable brack around this odd species. And you might know it's in the, in the same family with poinsettias. And you know with poinsettias, you've got these, these bracteal leaves around it, uh, function to make it look like petals. And I have to go back here to get the zoom off. There we go. Okay, so we're looking at some carrot family members here. And they have, they have their uh, full flowers and arrangements that form uh, sort of umbrella shaped things. Uh, I'll go ahead and give you the name of this. This one is yellow pimpernel, Tanidia integrema. I'm gonna blow it up here again. So here, here are your little umbrellas, but they're all scattered out. They don't all come together. These are the sub umbels and they come together to make the big umbel, a big umbrella. I want you to look at the leaves. These are, these are some of the, these yellow carrot family members. Some of them are, are confusing, but I'm gonna show you a couple here that are easy to, to learn to identify. 
if you look here at the leaflets, these are the leaflets of the plant. The edge is entire, that is, there's no toothing on the edge. And so if you're looking at these in the woodlands and you see something with uh, uh, yellow umbels of flowers, uh, and has these kind of leaves without the teeth, you know it's gonna be the uh, yellow pimpernel. So let's go back here. So this is the yellow pimpernel. Easy to identify among these guys. Some of the others are much more difficult. Here's another one, which is fairly easy. Hairy joint meadow parsnip. I'm going to blow it up here again. So we can look at this a little bit. Okay. So what you want to look at here, instead of being entire, it has some really deep cuts in it. It's incised. And it's the only one of these, these yellow carrot family uh, members. That, and you notice what it does. It has its sub umbels, but they're all tightly bunched together to make one, one umbrella. So that's a couple of these. I've been, been confused by the others. I seem to work on them and and don't learn them very well. I'll look down, you might, might notice down below here, we have one of our trilliums that we talked about below You Remember what that one is? That's the one with the, re, the recurved one with the sepals that go down below. So I'm gonna get out of zoom here. The name, hairy joint meadow parsnip, refers to the joint or node, the place where the leaf connects to the stem, has a few hairs on it, but you have to look closely to see it. And with this picture, you can't really see it. And here's one I expect everybody knows. But this was interesting to me because it's growing way up on Hinch Mountain, not near a stream. And this plant I usually expect to be near a stream. What is it? Virginia bluebells, Martensia virginica. And oh, look at this. Here it is again in white. And this was taken not up on the mountain, but down where there was actually a stream nearby, a more typical habitat for uh, Virginia bluebells. This is down near where the park headquarters is down in the Sequatchie Valley. Okay, and here's, here's a problem. Uh, up, up on the, the uh, area between Dorton Knob and Hinch Mountain, there used to be some people lived up there and had some open areas and multi-floor rows has gotten established. And I'm afraid that this might climb up onto some of the Dorton Knob areas and some of the others. So this is a, this is a concern, the multi-floor rows, invasive exotic that's making problems up here. Uh, this one, we're, we're now going to another area. This is our, our third area, the uh, Piney River Gorge. So here's some pictures to show what it looks like up there, the Piney River. This is Soap Creek. This is our maybe our newest state scenic river. I'm not pretty sure it is. Lovely, lovely, lovely place. The Cumberland Trail runs along right up over here on this side. Uses both the Piney River, uses Soap Creek, these is the uh, Stinging Fork uh, Falls Creek up that way. Here's uh, another creek, Duskin Creek. This is going to become an access trail to the Cumberland Trail. In the past, it has actually been the way the Cumberland Trail went, but that's changing. And I, I like to put this one to show you how clear that water can be up, up along the Cumberland Trail on some of these streams. That's probably 20 foot deep in there. You can see all the way clearly to the bottom with the mountain walls and green. At this time. Here's one of the, the, the common plants in the Piney River Gorge area growing in, in many of the places. The features to, to look at here, we have what looks like a whorl of four leaves down here. We also have whorls of flowers up here. It's a whorl of four leaves. Technically, it's two, two pairs of opposite leaves. This is in the mint family, the opposite leaves wear stem. And this is whorled horse bomb, Alansonia verticillate. Verticillate means whorl. Huh? Give you another picture. I think this is a really lovely plant. Here's one with a little different coloring, a little bit more of a pink in it. Okay, this, this struck my attention. This is up along Soap Creek by this very dense growth of uh, some toothworts. I've never seen anything quite so vigorous as this and, uh, early in the season uh, for this particular species of toothwort. Give you a little closer. Here's a little closer image of it. Unfortunately, the flowers aren't open. I've got another picture to show you with the flowers open. So this is slender toothwort, Dinteria heterophylla, which means mixed. And I'll show you why heterophylla mixed, mixed leaf is important here. You can actually see it in this picture, but you see it a little better in the next one. So here it is. Here's the same plant with a nice open. That's four petals. So mustard family members like this, we're gonna have four petals. 
They often are have a sort of biting taste to them, uh, often are used that way. So here's the stem leaves, two of them. That may, that's, that's usually the case for this species to have two, and some of the other species have three, but that's not real consistent. Here are the basal leaves down here. And notice that there's a great distinct difference between the basal leaves and these. So these are mixed. So this is a slender tooth wood. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's a favorite. I know some of you have gone to the wildflower programs, you know that you get to see this from along Abrams Falls. Well, it's scattered many places along the, the, the Piney River and along Silk Creek. And I like to think of these guys as wings and as propellers, and I just think they're lovely. Gay wings, Polygula passiflora. Lovely little flowers of that area. Here's a strange one. This one's only a couple inches tall, and it should look to you a bit like uh, maybe pine sap or Indian pipes. And it is related to those, but it's also somewhat set apart. Uh, you can see the petals up here under some of these scales. And the big thing, of course, you know, is it has no chlorophyll. And what is it? This is sweet pine sap, Tropsis odorata. And this picture was taken by Gretchen Kirkland. Uh, she sent that to, to a friend of mine for identification and he sent it on to me to identify. Um, so I hope she's happy with me using her, her picture. I didn't wasn't able to find a way to contact her. I did. I've never been. I didn't find this on the Cumberland Trail. Uh, I went to the area where she found it, but of course this thing is extremely difficult to find. It often is barely visible in the leaves. The leaves can be over the top of them practically. It's very difficult. Now, if you if you look this up in the uh, Tennessee Native Plant Society uh, wildflower book, it will call it a saprophyte. That's the way it used to be called. Now saprophyte usually refers to uh, fungi that do decomposing of, of dead material in the soil. Uh, you know, they're, that's not what these guys do. These guys connect to the fungi and make their living by somehow getting it from the fungi, whether they're parasites of the fungi. It's hard to say how it all works. Anyway, the name rather than saprophyte, which we're using these days is mycoheterotroph. Heterotroph just means you're not a green plant that makes its own food. Myco means uh, fungi. And what goes on under the ground is, is very complicated. These guys are connected to the fungi. The fungi are connected to the trees and many other plants. And all that connection is summarized in the word wood wide web, kind of a humorous name, but that's a very popular concept these days. Very interesting how all these plants in some ways work together. Food from the carbohydrates produced by trees ends up in many, many plants, maybe their own offspring in particular, like trees that, 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 they, that they've seeded. Uh, and how this all works and what it all means is a, is a big question, one that's being studied. So the wood wide web, you're gonna hear a lot about that. Here's a, a fairy wand. Is it male or female? So this is, I'm guessing it's female. I wanted to go back and look at this, but I couldn't. I wasn't able to go back and check to see for sure whether it was male or female. The males, had, when they're mature, tend to kind of hang over. This one's not hanging over very much. So let's assume it's a female. And the term for this is dioecious species. That is, they're both uh, male and female are in separate places. Here's one I've, I've, I've marked for the hike on that we're going to do on uh, next Saturday. A real, a real favorite. As I say, every, every time I see these, even though I, I, this is definitely not my first time to see a yellow, every time it's, it's, it's exciting to me. Um, so here I wanted to make it, here's one of Dennis's lovely pictures. And you can see how well focused and, and shot this is compared to my, my pictures, which are not very professional. Hopefully they're, they're good enough we can talk about them anyway. So I wanted to compare uh, these two yellow lady slippers and they have been considered as varieties or species right now this one over here is on the rare plant list for Tennessee. This is the small flowered yellow lady slipper, Cypripedium parviflorum. Uh, and it's important to me because if I find it, that means I found something on the state list and being a rare plant uh, surveyor, I need to know when I find something that's on the list. Uh, look at the differences between, between the two. This one is, is uh, it's hard to tell from this. It's supposed to be the pouch area of the orchid. Is, is a bit smaller than, than this one. This is a large flower. And look at the amount of red pigment up here in the, uh, the lateral, uh, lateral petals in the uh, dorsal sepal. And look at the amount of red in the, in the uh, 
pouch itself. So I'm hoping now I've got some idea how to recognize this guy because that could be important to me. And I suspect it's, this is probably found someplace along the Cumberland Trail. Okay, so just because people love lady slippers, I thought I would just talk a little bit about lady slippers. So the pink lady slipper is far and away the most common one. These are, this list is in order of their commonness. The large flower, the one, one which we'll, we'll be seeing next Saturday uh, is next most common. Then we get this one, which is a listed one. Here's the Kentucky lady slipper. This is a bottom land one. This definitely grows in gorges in the, in the uh, uh, Cumberland Plateau. Uh, it's, it's the largest of our lady slippers. It's, it's one of the protected ones. Here we have showy lady slipper. This is one in, in calcareous of limestone areas, uh, often uh, wet. Uh, it's also very rare. There's another one I've got listed down here, which has never been found in Tennessee. That's a small white lady slipper. But it's found in Kentucky and it's found in Alabama. So maybe someday we'll, we'll turn it up here. And here we come to the advertisements. This is one that uh, we had for uh, a presentation my son and I did about our book. But I wanted to, to uh, show you this plant right here. This is a small tree. And you look up here, it looks like there's a little blush up in here. That's natural. And I think that's a Beautiful little thing, that little coloration. Most of these guys have it. Uh, note the wavy edge on this guy. So this guy I'm thinking of should be the symbol of the Cumberland Trail. It's beautiful, it's scattered along the Cumberland Trail. And it's mountain camellia, Stewardia uh, ovata. Uh, it used to be considered in the camellia genus. You know, the camellia genus is the one that has our black tea. So I'm gonna go ahead. Here's Here's, the, uh, here's another picture of a uh, mountain camellia, the Stuardia, or Ovata, and it has purple filaments, interesting color variation. And I stole this from the herbarium, and I'm crediting Pat Cox for that one. Okay, here's another one of our advertisements. And now I'm gonna, this is a, a page of, uh, as I say, basics of the, of the Cumberland Trail, and I'll leave that up. And this down here is, if you want to find out about hiking on the Cumberland Trail, get, get the maps and the directions. This is the website you want to go to. And I'll turn this back to uh, Karen and Hillary for questions at this point. Are you there? Yes, we're here. here yeah. Okay, very good. Not a lot of questions, but um, I'll remind folks, if you have a question, please write it down in chat. And uh, we'll turn it over to... Uh, Larry, the, uh, the one question I see is retained beech leaves could also be housing overwintering predatory arthropods, which is an interesting idea. Okay. What, what, what are ostracots? What was arthropods. The arthropods, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting that suggestion. Is from Phil. Larry, do you know the timeline for connection or completion for some of these trailways you have listed here? Yes, uh, the, the, the Cumberland Trail, as, as you can see here, it talks about there's uh, 300 miles when finished, if you look at the, the basics there, uh, about 200, a lot more than 200 miles has been built. And it's, I'm involved with that process of, of the building of it. Uh, I've, I've worked with with uh, flagging the trails. I like to get out to the trails before they get built to, to check to see if they're about to, to destroy something. <laughs> so I try to get out and, and, and look at the trails. And in some cases, I've actually been involved with the design of the trail, marking the, the way for the trail to go. Uh, there, you know, we, uh, Unfortunately, uh, Bob Fulcher, who's the, the, the manager of the trail, keeps getting asked, well, when's it going to be done? When's it going to be done? And he always you know, tries to answer that question, but it's, uh, it's very difficult to do that, but it really is getting toward the end. And there are a lot of sections of the trail which have been built, but have not been officially opened. Um, there's a lot more trail out there than, than, uh, than has actually, but they don't like to open it up, up the state doesn't until they've got the uh, trailheads marked and the blazes on the trails and all the things ready to go properly. Sure, and if you haven't been there at all, there are 200 full miles, 200 plus you mentioned. Yes, yes, yeah, so, definitely more than, more than 
So, <laughs> so you want to go to that website, which you see there at the bottom. Now, that's not a state website, but the state uses that. Uh, it, it is the organization. You see, the Cumberland Trail did not start out as, as, a, as a state park. It started out as a project, uh, just, just of a group of people that wanted uh, that, that, which turned into the Tennessee uh, Trail Association. Uh, and that group now is, is called the uh, uh, CTC Cumberland Trails Conference. And uh, it continues to have a crew to build trails and uh, to do many things. And I'm highly involved with, with that group. So that's, that, that, that they, they are the history of the trail, which has now become a state park, which is a really good thing. And so the uh, uh, CTC works with, uh, with them to uh, uh, working on completing the trail and, and hopefully not doing anything very destructive in the process of building it, which I <laughs> try to work on. Larry, what is the... Yeah most unusual or your maybe your favorite flower from the Cumberland Trail? Well, you know, I was talking about the, uh, the uh, mountain camellia, and that is it's such a gorgeous thing. That's a small tree, and it's, it's usually small enough that you can see the flower as well. And that's scattered all along the trail. And I thought, well, that should be the, the, the symbol for the, the Cumberland Trail. That would be a, an outstanding thing to, to be, the, be the symbol. Mm -hmm. I uh, was trying to obtain a, 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 one of the plants from a nursery. Several uh, have said they have it, but uh, I have not found one in a nursery yet. So, <clears throat> one question. Oh, okay, yeah. How, to, how can you distinguish Saxifragia carinia from Saxifrage virginiensis? Oh, was it Cariana? Cariana, yes, yeah. Or my Cariana. Or my okay. okay. That. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that's a good question. The the uh, the the stem of the of the uh, Virginia one uh, is is stouter and, and, and a bit hairier. It's a, it's a very very vertical, not so uh, not at angles. Uh, they 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 look quite a bit different to me. I, I don't. I, I feel like I don't have much difficulty telling the difference. Uh, as you go west in Tennessee, you're going to have more of the Virginiensis one, the, the Virginia one. Uh, in the, it, it's, it's pretty rare in East Tennessee. Uh, Cariana, which is supposed to be on, just on limestone, turns out to be on all kinds of rocky surfaces, but a lot on limestone. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I can't tell you technically. Uh, I know I know how I look at them and see that I don't I don't remember the. What the key would, when the key, what the, what the characters would be, I'm not remembering that. Um, so, if, you know, anybody out there on this call who likes to, to or this uh, Zoom, who likes to build trails, there's a great opportunity, great need for, for volunteers. So, if you go to that website to read about it, it can connect you up to uh, uh, work on the trail, become a, a volunteer to, to build the trail. Okay. One comment is, looks like a gorgeous trail to hike in spring from Sandy Cook. Uh -huh. it, it certainly is. These gorges, all, all of them are, are wonderful places. And as I was trying to point out, uh, you know, many, many of them are fairly easy to get to. The, the places uh, that, that uh, uh, are up on Hinch Mountain are, are difficult to get to because you really need a high clearance vehicle to drive up there. There will be trails up there uh, eventually, but at this point, it's 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 difficult to to use that area unless you got high clearance. And uh, there's one one trail, but I I get off on all kinds of places up there. And there's there's, there's beautiful acres of trilliums that you saw up on Hinch Mountain. Uh, there are no no particular trails to those places. There may eventually be because some of it's on state land, some of it is not up on Hinch Mountain. But there are some of those beautiful areas. I was happy that some of the recent purchases by the state did pick up some of those areas which are just carpeted with a variety of trilliums and just a, a outstanding place. Uh, so I talked about the uh, Laurel Snow. That's, that's, that's an easy one to get to for some of you. Uh, an excellent place. You don't have to do, uh, it's a big wide, uh, fairly flat trail and it goes through lots of different uh, spring wildflowers. So that's a nice, easy place to to, uh, sorry, you don't have to travel too far from, from uh, you know, US 27 in Dayton to, to get to it. So 
I don't know if, if you've read through the, the Cumberland Trail basics and, and understand that the Cumberland Trail is just part of a, of a, a very long trail. It says 1,600, the Great Eastern Trail, which uh, the idea is that eventually that will take some of the pressure off the Appalachian Trail, which is very overcrowded in many areas. I think it, it uh, I don't, it, it, looking at the Cumberland Trail here in Tennessee, there's, there's, there's uh, nothing inferior about, about the Great Eastern Trail. Uh, you may not have the higher elevation things like you do with some of the Blue Mountains. Otherwise, there's uh, very scenic places like you have here in, in Tennessee, extraordinarily scenic. Does the Cumberland Trail have a different name when it leaves the state? Oh, yes. Yes, it's just Cumberland Trail in Tennessee. So the whole thing is called the Great Eastern Trail. Okay. And every state's going to have, it may, may well have their own names for the part which, which goes through them. In fact, I, I think that it, it's a Pinchon Trail maybe in Alabama. I'm trying to remember what those names are. I've, I've heard them from time to time, but I'm not re remembering what they all are. People have actually walked the whole Great Eastern Trail. But the way they have to do it, because it's not all completed, is to walk a lot of roads in between sections that have been built. Mm -hmm. So people have certainly walked through all these Cumberland Trail areas, but uh, they have stopped. And when, when my son and I did it uh, seven years ago, we used two cars and did a lot of car shuttles. It took us about a month to do what, was, what had been built at that time. And we averaged about eight miles a day. So that's, that's the, the, the advertisement you saw back there was for a book that we wrote about our hike of the Cumberland Trail at that time. Of course, a lot more has been built since. So how and does that. someone purchase that book? Uh, well, you can go to Amazon and okay. look for Wildly Strolling Along, which is the name of the book, or you can look for my name on Amazon. And there might be, I think that Frozen Head uh, Park, they were selling, I don't know if they still have copies there, but while they were selling it at, uh, at Frozen Head State Park. Wonderful. I don't know if you could find it in any bookstore. That might be hard. But, uh, um, and it's <laughs> not a trail it? guide. I, I think you need to, to understand it's not a trail guide. It's, it's a nature study, a father and son relationship book, uh, a memoir of some sort, but it does have a lot, a lot of natural history in it, both plants and animals. question. Is the Sheltawee Trace part of the Cumberland Trail? Something about the Sheltawee Trace? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hear it well. Is the Sheltawee Trace part of the Cumberland Trail? No. No. That's, that, that, of course, the Sheltawee Trace comes down into to Tennessee, uh, up in the Big South Fork area. And uh, there's talk about making a connection between the Sheltawee Trace and the Cumberland Trail, which would be at Frozen Head State Park. That's where the connection would be made. And I worked on uh, scouting out that route and that is being worked on. Uh, so that would connect the Cumberland Trail into a trail that goes up uh, through Kentucky and then uh, connects up into the Great Lakes Trail all the way up in Ohio. So there's a great system of trails that's being worked on. But uh, the Cumberland Trail itself is, is part of the Great Eastern Trail, goes up is to the Cumberland Gap uh, National Historic Park uh, up there by Virginia and Kentucky, and then connects into the other trails there at the Cumberland Gap. Okay. Well, Harlan says he received a copy of your book from Amazon. Okay. Well, Larry, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your excellent uh, presentation and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the the whole thing it's uh, it's a different world than uh, sc scampering around in the in the trail yourself. The only drawback is that we do not feel that atmosphere of the plant. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that it, it's 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 not exactly like leading a hike. To, to this, but but no. because I can put the words up on the screen, you you can see some of these terms and and. Uh, and recognize them by seeing them as well as hearing them. I think that- But you cannot see if the, education if the hairs on the plant are upright or lying down. Right, there you go. <laughs> and uh, so uh, thank you very much. And my, my hiking ability for long distance 
is not long distance anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, this that's way I feel I never, I never uh, quite caught up with the botany. But uh, have you studied the lichens? No, I haven't. We have, of course, we have that new book. That, that new book and that new mm -hmm. book is fantastic. And we have uh, the, the lichens of the Great Smoky Mountains National yes, Park, and, and it uh, would be, and, would and be used for many places. Is is a lot easier to understand than Brodo or anything else. It has mm -hmm. some common common words in there, and I got my. And uh, my favorite uh, uh, lichen, my peltigera, it's uh, and that's on my on my place, the peltigera. And so, uh, it anyway, I see. Uh, uh, no, I have a TVA question. Mm -hmm. How can I stop TVA on spraying on my property? Because okay. so, when I when I talked with them, they sent out that that pamphlet and that says we will be spraying again and we spray the trees. Well, no red butt is going to hit the wire way up there anyway. But uh, three years ago, they I uh, caught it right after they sprayed, and it's unnecessary to spray at the edges. And and I also have there are seeded patches from what is left what the highway hasn't taken of my T TBA passage. And there are still some patches of the of the wildflowers that were uh, put up there decades ago. And, uh, and uh, the answer I got from them, we spray unless you have a government, uh, from the government a restriction. Yeah. So who so can I... And those, yeah, it, it, uh, it is difficult, I, and and the Sweetsers, uh, you actually talked to the, the uh, Susan on Sweetser because they've had this same struggle, and uh, you know sometimes did they the TVA is a TVA is a large organization, and you may get in contact with one part of it and, and feel like you're communicating well. That part of TVA may not connect well with other parts. So I have to be a little pessimistic about this because they they. They really feel it's very important that we not have any brownouts or fires caused by the, the uh, power lines. And you remember that in California, they had that horrible problem with the uh, power lines uh, setting fires. Uh, yes, but, so they're, but they're, they're likely but to be very plate. difficult. Yeah, I, I, I would be pessimistic. You can do the best you can. You can, you, you, can con you know, you, you contact the, the, the officials, the but the, it's hard. And the personnel changes. So when you have uh, 10 right. years ago, you have found somebody who is sympathetic and that uh, does something, then uh, they have retired and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, so now the forester says he is going to look at it, but, uh, yeah. but he says we spray anyway, unless you have a government restriction. Well, you might, you might get some sympathy, but it's, 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 you're fighting a tough thing, you know, they, they have the legal right to, to, to do what they want to do and unless you can find some way to persuade them or get some kind of a legal junction, which I don't know how you would do, uh, you've, you've got a tough battle. Okay, thank you, Alice. Um, we have one more question and I'm not sure how to answer it or how. It says living, yeah. Kimberly says living on the Cumberland Plateau she has quite a few wildflowers that the original owner collected. Um, okay. How can I share the view with others? That's a technical question and we're, um, we set this up to share the view with Larry. Um, are, are, Beverly, are your plants inside, indoors or outdoors? Uh, they're in their natural habitat. Okay. Oh, okay. So these are not not uh, not a garden we're talking about here. This is no, uh, she planted them all over the two acres that I have. Oh, they're, they're and, planted. Uh, okay. Yeah, and uh, oh. like the the trout lilies, uh, I have some, but I've been told that if you were to transplant them anywhere except over a rock, that they'll actually dig their way down, and you'll never find them again. So uh, I'm very interested in finding out about the others and learning 
what I can do to preserve them. But I would like to share them. I mean, it's beautiful up here right now. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know if I could share photos or something. You know, yeah, I, th- online somebody with you there, all. Some people who uh, are uh, uh, into social media things might might be helpful answering that question as to good places to take your photographs to share with other people who would enjoy them and, and might uh, correspond about them. I'm, I'm not a I'm not on a lot of social media, so maybe somebody else might answer that. Well, I'm not either, but uh, oh, okay. I'm enjoying what you've showed us because I learned the names of some of the plants I have that i sure I knew them as a youth, but I've slept uh, since then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. part of the plant tour, are you located uh, I'm at the at the uh, edge of the Cumberland Plateau. Uh, McMinnville is the closest place that okay. I can uh, locate you with. Mm-hmm. But if you come up so the Highway 56, I'm just well, I'm in the middle of Bishop Springs. Okay, Bishop Springs, great great place. We've had a lot and of problems with Bishop Springs. We we've gone there many times to to have uh, yeah. annual meetings and other things there. Yeah, we love Bishop Springs over here. Down doors, yes. Beverly, this is Karen. Um, yes. If you would put uh, your contact information, um, send a little note to me through our website. Okay. On the contact page. If you'd send me your contact information, we can talk directly. It's possible we can connect you with a, some other excursion up there. If you would mind oh, yes. coming up to visit. Oh, that would be fine. Do you need a phone number or? A phone or, number or an email, something like that. Okay, I'll give you both. Thank you. And then we'll see if we can't connect and get a little more information and find a way to share. Well, I just hate for them not be seen because they're so pretty. <laughs> if nothing else, maybe we can get a handful of photographers up there to take pictures for us. Oh, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> we have a lot of photographers in this group. Some are better than others, and yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> but we all try, and we all love the plants. <laughs> okay, we'll see what we can do then. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, also, awesome. my Bob first Dave? time, so I just joined, so I'm I'm excited about it. Oh, very this. good. Wonderful. Glad, glad Davis, you joined. Bob Davis had a suggestion. He says there's a Facebook page called What's Blooming in Tennessee where people do post pictures. What's uh, growing I, in Tennessee? What's blooming in Tennessee? Oh, okay. And and I log in, I come take a pic. Um, I look into that page very often. And they do have a lot okay. of Okay. Yes, that would be great. I don't know what their rules are. Some have rules about how many photos you can Post. Right. Well, I'm not the best photographer in the world, but I enjoy the flowers so much. Well, we'll see if we can't get some, maybe at least get a small group together and send them up. I would love it before these disappear. I have even got something that they told me was mountain uh, iris. They're a little miniature iris. Okay. Oh, Larry. That's probably oh. iris burner. I've got packs of them. Crested iris and iris burner. But the one that's more of a, a mountain species, more upslope, would be the Iris verna. Ah. It's got, okay. it's got a lot of yellow, a lot of yellow in the flower. Often. I haven't looked at them that closely. They're so small. But are, uh, are these in, in a moist place or a dry place? Um, they're in a shady spot. Um, they're on the side of a hill. It's not a steep mm-hmm. hill. It's just a slope that goes down to to a water stream. Well, that, that could be probably close to a water stream. The dwarf crested iris is 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 is, uh, is the more common one, but uh, you might the have the other crest, one too. Crested, okay. Dwarf crested, dwarf crested iris. Okay. That's that's the more yeah. common one. There's, there's two of these little woodland irises. Other ones are mostly okay. wetland. <laughs> yeah, well, they popped up in places I didn't uh, didn't even know they were growing this year. Yeah. Besides the one I, I've spotted back in the woods here. 
Okay. Are there any, any other questions, folks? If not, I'm going to suggest that we sign off. And I'll hey. remind, I would like to remind everyone that we do have another meeting next month, another seminar next month, May 18th. Mark your calendars. Milo Pine will be talking about the native plants of the cedar blades. So that's what May date 18th. Is that, Karen? What is it, Louise? What date? May 18th. Okay, thank you. Okay. And you said Milo? Yes, Milo Pine. It should be a good one. Will it be at 6.30? Same time. Okay. Seven? Uh, 6.30 uh, Central, 7.30 Eastern. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is Dennis still on? Yes, he is. Dennis? You're muted, Dennis. You're muted. Well, Larry might could answer my question. Uh, Dennis, the weather forecast is showing very cold temperatures the next few nights. Is there any danger that those Sanandras are going to freeze? Sanandras? Yeah. They, they could since they flower so late in the spring season. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, I know they could, it's gonna drop below freezing probably in those areas uh, the next couple of mornings. Well, I'll, I'll go down there Thursday anyway, but I just, when I saw that this morning, I thought, oops, that may <laughs> take care of them. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Larry. There's several mm -hmm. folks have commented in the comments to relate to you. Thank you, thank you. It's been mm -hmm. fun. It's a privilege to see the plants again that I've saw as a as in my youth, and that I can't climb back up to walk take a look at again. <laughs> oh. Which is many of us. <laughs> but thank you. That was excellent. Lovely job and. We appreciate your time. Yeah. And I'll say good night to everyone. Good night. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night.